Okay, so it's just a little bit after 10, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So this uh, online meetup is going to be um, introducing Docker 113, which we're all really excited about here at Docker. So um, we have here with us uh, core team member and release captain Victor Bu, and he'll introduce us to what's new with Docker 113. And uh, he'll first give you an overview and then um, demo some of the new features. So I will give it over to Victor. Right. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. So my name is uh, Victor Vieux. Um, I'm the release captain of uh, Docker 113, and I'm part of the engine team. And today I'm going to talk about what's new in, in 113 and, uh, and yeah, do some, do some demos uh, along the way. So the first one, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the CI uh, commands uh, restructuration. Um, I'm going, I'm going to, to jump into a machine, so it's going to be uh, hopefully easier to understand. Um, right, I hope it's big enough. So if uh, you take uh, Docker 112 and you look at the usage, it's, it's really huge usage. Uh, you have all the commands that are top level. Some of them, like build or run, are of course super important. You use them almost every day. But some of them, like pose or I don't know, a few like history, you tend to use those commands less often. So basically, what we did is uh, our goal is to clean up the the usage and make uh, make the Docker CLI more more easier to understand. So. What we did in uh, 113 is uh, we basically regrouped every every command under uh, the object they are managing. So, for example, to list the container, you would do Docker container list. To list uh, image uh, images, you do Docker image list. Um, and basically, if you use Docker image dash uh, h, you see all the subcommands that are part of the image. So. You have image build, image import, uh, image remove. So since we don't want to break uh, everybody, all the other commands are still supported and are, are still shown. But it, we added a, an environment variable called docker hide legacy commands that will give you an idea of what Docker uh, will probably look like in, I don't know, 114, 115, something like this. And it's going to be something like this. Docker hide legacy commands. So yeah, in the future, it might, might look like this. So the usage, it's pretty clean. You have all the top level objects and we just kept a few, very few comments that, as I said, were are, are really like important. So, build, run, version, those we don't we don't want to move them. But yeah, in 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 the future it might look like this. So today, uh, I mean, I would recommend you to start using those new commands. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're writing blog posts or tutorials or if you have uh, docs that you, you wrote using Docker, I would suggest you to update those docs to use uh, those new commands uh, because uh, it's uh, the way we want to, to go forward. And every new command we're going to add to Docker, I'm going to talk about a few, but we added some commands uh, in this release. They're all under the, the whole object. It's not, it's not top level commands anymore. Um, so yeah, uh, we just we just uh, change the, the CLI command this way. Next one, I want to talk about experimental. Uh, this one also is a, it's a big one. So in Docker 112 and before, you basically had two two builds of Docker. You had a Docker stable and you had Docker experimental. So it's, it was when you installed Docker, you had to make that choice: Do I want to, the Docker stable or do I want the Docker experimental? The main uh, issue with this is uh, if you went with stable and then you decided, oh, I want to try the experimental features, uh, it become really a pain 
because uh, you basically had to reinstall your Docker completely. Uh, not different, it's only one, one build of Docker and the, the experimental features are enabled or not uh, with a flag on the daemon. So again, let me uh, show you and make this bigger. So here if I do a docker system info, you see that it says experimental false. And for example, if I look at the usage of a docker build, you see here I don't have a dash dash squash parameter. Now uh, what I can do is uh, I can change uh, the Uh, sorry. I can change how I change how I start the, uh, the my Docker daemon. So I'm going to comment this line, and basically I'm just adding the dash dash experimental here. So I'm adding the flag. I'm uh, restarting Docker. And now if I do uh, system info, you see experimental equal true. And you see, if I do a build, that I have this new flag. So how does it work? It's really simple. Basically, the, every time you do something with the CLI, the first uh, command that it's going to do is going to do a ping on the daemon. It's going to say, OK, is, is this daemon experimental or not? And if it is experimental, it's going to show you in the usage um, the experimental features and allow you to, to use them. So we basically are doing a, a round trip uh, on the CLI to, to decide whether or not the demand is experimental. Uh, next, the CLI backward compatibility. So I put a sentence here. Basically, with uh, 113, you can use a newer, newer client to talk to an older demon. It's, work, it's working at the same way as experimental, basically. Uh, the CLI is going to talk to the daemon, and uh, while it's getting the information, is it experimental? It, it's also getting what uh, the version of the daemon, and then it can it can downgrade accordingly. So, just a few a few pictures to understand. On the left, before if you had, uh, for example, if you had Docker 11 installed on uh, your uh, I don't know in your production machine, you could use the Docker 11 CLI, of course, because uh, it goes with it. You were also able to use the Docker 1.10 CLI, an older one. Uh, the, the, uh, the Docker daemon was able to understand older CLI, but, but it was impossible to use, for example, the 1.12 CLI because it was uh, greater than 1.11, and um, the, the daemon didn't know how to respond to that. Right now, on the right side, uh, it's basically you can do it every way. So you can have a Docker 1.12 uh, daemon on your on your production machine, for example, and uh, you can use a 113 client to talk to it. And it's, it's really useful because, uh, I mean, the, the, the biggest use case is uh, if on, you have on your laptop, if you have Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, it's uh, most of the time it's like uh, auto-update auto enabled, so you always have the latest version of the client on your, on your laptop. And it's... Uh, it's very frequent that uh, on, on production, on your machine in production, you have an older Docker engine because, let's face it, you won't update your Docker engine every time a new one is out uh, on your production machine. So before you had to switch between a newer, you have to you had to like keep on your laptop an old client lying around just to connect to your production machine, and and use uh, the other one for for Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows. Right now, you don't have to do that anymore. Basically, newer client can talk to uh, older version of, of uh, Docker. So we we change the, the API, the CLI, so it has some some backward compatibility code in it. Uh, then I want to talk about encryption at rest. So it's uh, for uh, Docker Swarm. So if, if you're using uh, Swarm mode. Everything is encrypted into the the raft, um, the built-in uh, raft uh, that I made that uh, is in SwarmKit. So 
I mean, list of manager, list of node, list of services, everything is encrypted. And uh, basically how it works is it encrypts everything and it puts the keys to, to decrypt everything on, on your file system. So when a manager reboot, for example, it can uh, connect to the to the raft see, and get the keys from his uh, local file system and uh, unlock itself, and then it, it can see the content. Um, that's uh, how how uh, Swarm mode always works. Um, so it, it's great, but uh, we know some people want uh, more control over this. I don't know if someone gets access, for example, to your to your root file system, it might get the key and, and try to to unlock itself. So um, basically, a new flag was added to to Docker Swarm update and Docker Swarm init called dash dash autolock. And basically, when you add the autolock um, flag, what it means is as soon as um, a manager restarts or something, it's going to lock itself and uh, you have to provide the key yourself to unlock it. So you do docker swarm unlock and you give the key and uh, and it works. Uh, you can also use the unlock key command to show the unlock key or to rotate it. Uh, basically, if you're familiar with uh, Vault, the tool for MashiCorp, the same concept as uh, seal and unseal. Um, it's the uh, so in any case, everything is encrypted, but uh, if you want one, one extra level of protection and you want to require human interaction to, to unlock uh, your, your data and, and, um, in case of a manager restarting or something like this, uh, you want to use the autolog flag. Then let's talk about plugins, one of the, the biggest new features of uh, 113. So, we redesigned the whole uh, plugin uh, of Docker, how they work in uh, 113. Actually, this work started in 112, so you might have uh, tried those in 112. Uh, it was experimental at the time. Now in 113, it's out and it, it's stable. So what's new with this, those plugins is that those plugins are managed by Docker. Their lifecycle is managed by Docker. So you install the plugin through Docker, and then Docker is going to start the plugin. It's going to make sure your plugin is running, and uh, if something happens, it's going to restart your plugin automatically, and uh, it's just it's just uh, more useful. And also, plugins are distributed via via the registry, via the Docker Hub. So uh, let's uh, let's do an example. I'm going to open three terminals, and um, show you how it works. So. Okay. So um, let me put my full script here. So I have three machines uh, on one of those terminals each. The first step is I'm going to install my plugin on the machine in the middle. So to do that, it's simple. It's a Docker plugin install, and then the plugin name. Here it's uh, my viewer slash sshfs. So uh, it's a plugin that uh, once you install the plugin, it's going to add a new volume driver. So then you will be able to use to create volumes using this new driver, and this driver is uh, sshfs. So basically, it allows you to uh, remotely mount file system from using the SSH protocol. So it's just a demo. It works, but it's it's uh, it's of course uh, not performant in production. So just a just a demo. So when when I do this, uh, it's it's basically going to talk to the Docker Hub. It's going to get the manifest of this plugin, and in the manifest, uh, the plugin author. So in this case, myself. I wrote a list of privileges that are required for my plugin to run. In that case, I want my plugin to use the host uh, networking because it's really uh, networking intensive. I need the defuse device from the host. I want to have it in my container inside the container. It's used by SSHFS, and I need to have the Capsys admin capability uh, to do mounts. So uh, I'm going to say yes, I want to install this plugin. 
And once I said yes, then it's going to pull the actual plugin and uh, install it. Then I can do a Docker plugin list, and you see that uh, the plugin is running, it's enabled. You have a small description. I can do a Docker plugin inspect also, and um, you get the JSON, so it be, might be a bit hard to read, but. Um, so you have at the entry point, you have um, here the interface. So basically it's saying that this plugin is a volume driver, as I was uh, telling you. You have the whole config, so the list of capabilities. Um, I don't need this plugin to create new devices, but I could if I wanted to. I don't have mounts. Um, yeah, basically a few, a few settings. And um, yeah, also in the environment, you see I have one environment variable, which is called uh, debug. And you basically see it, that it's settable. Its value is settable. So right now debug is equal to zero, but I can set it to one if I want. And I'm going to do that. But to change settings of a plugin, I had to disable it. So first, Docker, Docker plugin disable my plugin. So now if I do a plugin list, you see that uh, it's not running. And then I can do a Docker plugin set. Look at the usage. And plugin. So Docker plugin set, again, the plugin. And then I want uh, to have a debug equal one. I can re-enable my plugins inside my modification. And uh, yeah, plugin is enabled. If I look at the, if I do an inspect, you see the environment variable, it's equal to one. So I can also do that in uh, just one step. I'm doing it at the bottom here. If I can do a Docker plugin install, and after the plugin name, I can put, uh, the settings I want to apply. So I can do that uh, directly here. Uh, same, show me the privileges I can accept. So uh, if if you are uh, scripting all of this, once you accept it once and, and you know that you trust uh, the plugin, we have a flag on uh, Docker plugin install, which is a grant all permission. And it, it's basically not going to ask you for the privileges. Uh, going to grant them uh, by default, so it's like it's like a dash Y on, on uh, after you get installed or stuff like this. So you can also, when you install, you can disable plugin. Uh, we have also an alias uh, flag to change its name, but that, that's more the advanced uh, users. So anyway, I now have my plugin installed on those two machines. Um, so one, now that my plugin is installed, I can uh, create a new volume. So Docker volume create, I'm going to use my uh, plugin as a driver. And then this one is uh, specific to the driver. It takes a few options on uh, volume create. It takes a SSH command, so basically it's a user at IP uh, column, the path I want to mount, and uh, the password. So going to do the same command on uh, two machines. And if I do a Docker volume list, I see I see the plugin. So I have on the two machines, I created two volume with the exact same name in this case that are pointing to the same machine, this one. And um, the last step is to uh, use those uh, volumes. So on the first machine, I'm going to uh, do a Docker run of the Alpine image, and I'm going to use my volume, the SSL volume I just created, and I'm going to put it in slash data and start a shell. So it's going to pull Alpine. Uh, I can go in data. It's uh, empty. so. 
can do echo hello world. So in the volume, I created a file uh, word. And if on another machine, I uh, start again a shell and I buy mount uh, the volume as well. If I go in data, I do see my uh, my file. I can uh, remove it from here, and uh, after a few seconds, it's, it's removed from the from the, the other container. So basically, here what I did is uh, without installing basically anything on my on my host, and it was just through Docker. I installed the plugin from the hub that added a new capability to my engine. This capability was a new volume driver. I then created one volume on every machine that pointed to the same uh, shared directory. And, and then I was able to share data between two containers on two different machines. So a few, uh, a few comments. The container themselves, the, sorry, the plugin themselves, they are running as, as containers but uh, they, are, they are running as restricted low-level containers. So you won't see the plugin here if I do a Docker container list. You don't see it. it it's, it's a runcy container, so if, if you know how to use uh, the low-level tools of Docker, if you, if you list containers with runcy, you will see the plugin running, but it, it, it won't appear in, in Docker container list. And that's because we don't want you to have control in it. We don't want you to be able to just restart it or kill it or, or whatever. It's a Docker job. So, of course, if you, want, if you want to stop it, you use a Docker plugin command. Docker plugin disable, Docker plugin enable, something like, like this. Uh, other thing I want to mention is uh, this plugin is hosted on the hub. So, um, it's, it's here. Uh, it, it looks like an image, but it's not, trust me, it's a plugin. It's, it's a really small one, so um, if you try to Docker pull it, uh, Docker will know that it's, it's not an image, uh, that it's a plugin, and it's going to tell you, uh, don't use Docker pull, but uh, use the Docker plugin install instead. So everything works pretty uh, seamlessly. Um, yeah. And uh, one last thing that I want to show you is, um, so first, let me remove. No, I don't think I need to. So, in 113, you are all the plugin commands. It's it's uh, it doesn't work with the swarm mode yet. So you basically have to do plugin install on every machine yourself. But once the plugin is installed, you you are able to use it uh, via services. And here, I'm going to to take advantage of the fact that I named the volume exactly the same on the two machines. So uh, on the first machine on the top, I'm going to do a Docker Swarm in it to create a swarm. Uh, it looks like I have two IPs, so it asked me to choose the right one. I'm going to use my public IP. Okay, so I created a swarm. The two other machines are going to join. All right, if I do a Docker node list, I have my three machines, my three machines, the machine I'm on right now is the leader. So everything is good. Next step is I'm going to do a Docker service create. I'm going to say use the dash dash mount that uh, I believe it's a new flag. It's it's uh, like dash v for Docker run, but it's easier to, to understand. It has a key value, key value concept. So the source will be my volume. The destination will be slash data, as I did previously. I want two replicas. I want to name it foo. And then uh, basically what those containers are going to do is they're going to write their host name inside a file in the, uh, in the volume. So nothing too specific. So I did the Docker service create. If I do a Docker service list, you see that the volume, the sorry, the service was created. I have uh, two replicas. Um, then I can do uh, PS. I have one 
instance is running on machine uh, demo one and the other instance is running on machine demo two. So they are not on the same machine. And um, if I go on the, if I go myself on the directory that I shared, uh, so you see that uh, the hostname file was created and, uh, oh, I went too fast. Yeah, I guess my, my example were probably not great, but here you should see basically both host name uh, being uh, being alternated because uh, every machine is using the plugin. So, uh, so yeah, basically you can definitely use the plugins with uh, SwarmKit. For now, you cannot install new plugins uh, via SwarmKit. You have to install them manually, but after that, uh, you can definitely use them. Uh, let me clean up and continue to the next um, next item. Um, so yeah, I, I think I covered pretty much everything. Oh yeah, and to create a plugin, of course we have a plugin create command. It's not using Docker files. Uh, it's it's a bit more complex than uh, creating just Docker images, and that's that's mainly because creating plugins uh, basically is not for everybody. It's uh, it's going to be mostly for I don't know vendors and and people like this. Like everybody can cre create Docker images today. Plugins, it's it's a bit more complicated to create. So that's why it's, it's not using Docker files, but. Uh, it's it's still pretty simple. It's, you do Docker plugin create the name you want to give, and there's the path to the root FS and the the configuration, and that's it. You have a plugin, then you can uh, Docker plugin push push it on on the hub. Next, uh, right, the other big one is uh, compose to swarm. So. Uh, Back in, in DockerCon, when we announced Docker 1.12, uh, we announced uh, Swarm mode and Swarm kit. So now with Docker, you can schedule services that run across multiple machines. Uh, you can see their tasks. You can uh, reschedule, do tons of uh, shiny things. But uh, unfortunately, uh, if, if, you, if you're using Docker Compose, the Python tool, it would start containers. It, it wouldn't start services. So basically, those two are incompatible. Uh, in, with Docker 1.13, we, we aim to fix this. To do that, we added the docker stack command. So, um, let me create a swarm first, and then I can, uh, okay. then I can kill those two. We added the docker stack command. Where you can basically deploy a stack list, a stack or remove a stack. A stack, uh, it's basically a collection of services. So to, to put it simpler. And for the deploy, so when I want to start a stack, so deploy a group of services, I can use a compose file. And uh, so that that's great. You basically don't need the don't need the Python tool anymore. You can take a compose file just run it through Docker and it's going to deploy you swap services. One, one small change though. So we introduced a new, a new format of Compose V3. It looks exactly like V2, but uh, you just add V3 at the top. And we had to change a few, a few things. The main differences compared to V2 is V3 doesn't support all the things that are not portable. So build, for example, uh, using build instead of an image aim won't work. Using volume from also won't work because it introduced dependencies that are uh, hard or I don't even know if it's possible to have them uh, the way Swarm was built uh, since it's uh, completely, uh, completely, I think, runious. And we also added uh, a bunch of Swarm specific options like the number of replicas, the mode, etc. So 
Yeah, the, the key stuff to, to take, keep in mind is V3, we removed a few non-portable options and we added all the swap specific options. Let's uh, take an example. Here I have a compose file. So version three, as I was saying, it's uh, basically the voting app that uh, you, we demo often, like we saw at DockerCon. So with the vote, the result, a uh, few workers, and the visualizer. So um, this one, so you see this deploy keyword is new. It uh, belongs only to version three. And we basically say we want two instances of Regis. And we have the update config. So it basically means uh, when uh, I do an update on this service, I want to take down two instances, update them, and then wait 10 seconds, and then take down the next two, and, and so on and so on. And we also added the restart policy on failure. So basically, this keyword is uh, belongs to version three. For the database image, we again in the deploy keyword we have we have also a plasma section where we put constraints. So here I said, okay, I want my DB to run on the manager. Uh, after I think it's pretty much the same. We added a bunch of, of uh, update config and. Uh, you can add labels also in the deploy. Um, the restart policy, you can you can specify parameters. So, and then we create networks and volumes as as you would do with the with the regular compost file. And so let's uh, let's use it. So I'm going to a Docker stack deploy, and my compost file, and I'm going to give it a name. Um, and let's call it we have no idea. So as you see it's passing the compose file, it's creating the networks, uh, the volume, it's going to create all the services. And that's it. So Swarm is asynchronous. So if right now I'm doing a Docker service list, it's not everything is not started yet. Uh, it's pulling images and uh, that's that's completely expected. But um let's go back to the stack command. So I can do deploy I showed, I can list a uh, stack. I have one stack uh, with six services. I can do a Docker stack services and uh, it basically showed me all the services that are part of uh, this stack foo. I can do PS to show all the tasks, the individual tasks. But yeah, this track you're probably pretty familiar with uh, we have the same in, in Docker node, it's, uh, it's just some filter in the UI. Okay, so it looks like the Redis result and vote uh, are uh, running. We're still waiting on the worker right now, and uh, we should be good. Anyway, while, while we're waiting. So as you can see in uh, the compose file, I um, If I look at the visualizer, you see I, I um, use the port 8080 for uh, the visualizer. So if you saw already how 112 works, you would know that we basically exposed the port 8080 on the SwarmKit mesh network. So basically I can hit 8080 on any machine on the on the cluster, any of those three machines, and uh, the the routing mesh will uh, redirect the request to the to the container to the right machine. Okay, so everything started. Let me get my IP here. And so up. if I go here on port 8080, yeah, you see I have uh, two or three machines in the cluster and you see the Repartition of the of uh, the services, so I have two registries on two different machines. Same for results. And um, let me get another port. Uh, I think vote we used uh, five thousand. So yeah, we can vote here. And uh, I don't remember. Yeah, probably one. And uh, of course, see the results on this one. And uh, so yeah. As I was, as I was saying, if 
I quit this one and go to another machine. So here, you see that I do have some containers running. Uh, if I get the IP of this one, so this is another machine. And yeah, the routing mesh allow me to uh, to basically eat any machine on the cluster, and it's going to be redirected. Uh, so. Um, yeah, basically what I just showed is uh, take a compose file. Most of the time a compose v2 would work. Uh, you just need to bump the version. Uh, if if you were using some um, if you were using some um, non portable options, you would have to to remove them, and and then you can you can start basically you can deploy stacks from a compose file directly from Docker. No need for the Python tool. And uh, let me go back to demo one. Yeah, I can uh, Docker stack remove. And it's removing the services and the networks. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's, really, it's really easy if, if your app is basically contain multiple services, I just use uh, stack. All right, next one. Um, we added uh, some new data management command. Um, we basically added uh, the two mains are Docker System GF. It, it shows you uh, all the disk space and that um, your Docker instance is using. So here I put an example. I have five images. Only one is active. So I'm only using one image right now, one image right now. Uh, the size combined of all those images is almost 3 gigs. And it, as you can see, I basically can reclaim um, 2.6 uh, gigs because the only, using, the only image I'm using is a small one. So I can reclaim 95% of this size. Uh, containers, I have one and it, it's used. And volumes also, it's really easy to have uh, like orphan volumes lying around. If you remove a container but you forgot to remove the volume, uh, basically after it's it's a match, you get you end up with ton of volumes. And here is the same. Uh, all my volumes combined, uh, they have they're like uh, more than three gigs, and looks like I'm only using one volume, and this volume is like 800 megs, so I can I can reclaim uh, two gigs. So. The Docker system DF command, it shows you what is reclaimable and where are you uh, wasting some space. And then we added the Docker print command, system print command that is basically going to remove every unused data. So if you look at the example of the on top and I do Docker system print, it's going to warn me, are you sure you want to remove uh, four images, three volumes? And um, if you say yes, uh, it's going to remove everything and then uh, Show you, okay, uh, you just reclaim five gigs of space. So it's it's really useful to maintain your your Docker instances. Um, it's it's really easy to lose uh, to to, lo to lose some some space. Some this space, this space it goes fast. Uh, these comments are great. So you have Docker system prune to remove all a new data. But if you only want to prune, I don't know, containers for example, you can you can do Docker container prune. The same, but uh, it will only apply to containers. And uh, you can also print networks, so it's going to look at all the orphan volume uh, networks, all the volumes that are unused, and, um, and and remove them. Uh, then quickly, I'm going to go much more faster on some small commands we added um, and features. So the first one is experimental. So as I said, you don't need the experimental build anymore, but you do need to have dash dash experimental enabled when you start the Docker daemon. Uh, we added the dash dash quash option to Docker build. Uh, so it's, go it's going to produce only one layer at the end. So it's been a request for a long time. Of course, uh, you have to understand the trade-off. Yes, the, re the image you produce is going to be way smaller because it only has one layer. But you're going to also lose all the how say that all the I mean the layering system today. If, if your layer, if your image is if 15 layer and you just uh, change the last layer, 
when you push, it's only going to push uh, the last layer, so the push will be pretty fast. The image itself will be big, but the, the change uh, is just going to do a diff and, and, and push only what's needed. If you do a squash, it has to, since it's just one layer, it has to repush everything, everything, every time. So it's, uh, I would say, if, if it's like in development and you are continuously um, improving your, your image, I would not use Squash, but maybe when when you're happy with your app and you know you won't touch it for a long time, it's a good to squash it and then to push it so it's a much smaller. We also added service logs. Um, so if you use uh, logs on the Docker Compose uh, Python tool, uh, the the UX is uh, roughly the same. Uh, you basically can uh, do Docker service logs. You can pass a service. Maybe this service has like five instances, and then on the top left you would see like every line of the logs will be prefixed by uh, which instance uh, is, it, is it giving you the logs. We also added a new um, Docker init binaries. So uh, once you install Docker 113, you will have a new binary in your class called Docker init. And it's basically a binary that is launched by Docker every time you run a container, and it, it's launched as a PIE1. And its goal is when you are, when your container stops, this binary is responsible to killing every like zombie processes um, that uh, might be might be staying. Um, we know like many people have have been doing it, uh, but before it was kind of a hack. You had to launch your init system by yourself uh, as PID one, and it was quite complicated. So now it's it's included in Docker. Um, we added two flags: dash init and dash init path on Docker D to specify which Docker init you want to use. Uh, by default, we ship with one. Uh, it's, uh, you can see the source code here. It's a, it's a tool made by the community that uh, we decided to, to vendor and use uh, with the agreement. But if, if you want to use your own, uh, it's, it's totally fine. You can, with those two flags, you can change to use your own. We also so added a bunch of new flags, uh, just to name a few. On Docker build, for example, we added dash dash network. So if you need to do a Docker build and you need to do to be on a specific uh, overlay network, you can do that now. We added uh, dash dash host on service create. Uh, we have this flag on run already. It allows you to basically uh, add new hosts in HC host in your container. We also added dash dash tty dash dash host name and, and DNS. Um, it's it's um, basically we're going to add more and more to be able to support uh, Compose on top of services. We basically needed to support almost everything that uh, Compose V2 was supporting. So we we did decide that um, as I mentioned, build and, and volume from uh, are not supported. But for example, we knew that TTY you you are able to set TTY in your Compose file. So for sure, we need TTY in in the, in in Docker services, that's why we we had it here. So we're going to continue. If we if we see flags that uh, are uh, in Compose but are are, are not in uh, in services, I'm going to add them uh, in the next uh, next release. We also did a few uh, orchestration enhancements. Uh, Basically, now when you run an image uh, in in SwarmKit, uh, SwarmKit is going to pin it using his uh, digest. So it's very useful because uh, if later on you need to, like for example, here I'm, I'm um, creating a service with Redis latest. Swarm is going to pin this uh, image as uh, its uh, digest, and then if uh, let's say there is a new Redis image, I yeah, let's say the Redis force that push a new image. If I need to reschedule my image on my cluster, or if I need to add new instances, it, with this, I'm sure it's going to use the exact same version for every instance on my cluster, instead of just using latest and, and maybe getting a newer one. So it's nothing you have to do, it's just an enhancement. Um, basically pin automatically images. We can also roll back on a service update. Um, before you were, doing, were doing a running update, you basically had two choices. It was continue, so just continue and failure, or just stop uh, abort and failure, I think it was called. Now we have uh, the way to roll back. So if something is wrong in the uh, rolling update, uh, yeah, it can roll back to, 
previous version, which was uh, threshold. So let's say you want to upgrade the five instances, but uh, I mean, you know your app and you know like uh, one might fail, it's okay. You can set the threshold to two, and so it will only do something if, if two uh, updates are failing. Um, we improved scheduling, I won't go into detail, but uh, basically the spreading of tasks is more efficient. And we also improve some constraints. Uh, now, when when uh, it's unable to schedule a task, it shows you why it's not able to to schedule. Um, you can put constraints on global services now. So you can say, I want this service to be global, but only on a machine that say I don't know region equal uh, U.S. West. So it's 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 super useful and. Um, and I don't know when you when you change something when you change uh, a label on a node, for example, it's going to remove all the tasks that uh, were assigned on, on this node because of the label. So just uh, just some improvements, nothing nothing new per se in the UX, or you don't have anything new to do, but uh, it's just uh, various improvements. So that's it for for all the all the news in uh, Docker 113. Just a reminder, uh, we have Docker 117 coming in April in August 14. I just put a link here if you, to have a 10% off your DockerCon ticket, so if you don't have a ticket yet and you want to, to join us, feel free to visit this link. Um, I'm going to look at the, the questions now on the, on the chat. Uh, yes, the Docker completion has been updated, um, and it, it, it also supports uh, the environment variable I mentioned. So if you use docker hide legacy commands equal one to basically do like, uh, oh sorry. So the first question was, has uh, docker command completion has been updated to support the new structure? Yes, it has been. And if you have uh, this environment variable, it will uh, respect it correctly. So it basically won't also complete uh, the old uh, legacy commands. It has been updated for bash and for DSH. Uh, question two, please address security. So I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Uh, I discovered it with uh, this uh, this slide. So again, everything is encrypted at rest. It was already the case in 112, no change here. We just added a way for you to have more control and basically allow users to use their own key to, to, to unlock uh, the, the cluster. Question three. Are plugins only installed uh, local or can it install across the whole swarm? So, so far in 113, it's only installed local. Um, it's, it's going to probably evolve in 114, 115. Uh, we're going to install plugin through swarm, but so far it's only local. So, you have to go to every machine yourself and install it by hand. Question four If the file is written from a different server to the same volume, how they handle? File handles, will there be a race condition? I assume both operates as matter. I think, at least in this case, uh, it's, it's handled by, by Fuse, by SSHFS. Uh, it's, I never had a problem uh, with like two concurrent writing the same file, but but once again, this plugin is like a, a demo. It's, it's definitely in that used for, for production. I think we did just merge, or we are about to merge, um, some, some doc to use the Rexray plugin. So if, if you're familiar with Rexray, it's a, it's a well-known project that allows you to use uh, EBS volume and, and other volumes inside your containers. And uh, they they are in the process of making a plugin. So we have the same way, you could like a uh, Docker plugin install Rexray and then use use EBS as volume. It's probably more performant and, and definitely uh, more production ready that, that plugin. Yes, so question says, five, I said do not use the SFH plugin. Uh, what's the best practice to share volume across the kernels? So far, I would say wait for a better plugin. Um, for networks, we have everything in house for volumes. Unfortunately, we don't. We don't provide an out of the box a volume plugin that works across the swarm. It's, uh, we're working on it, but it's not here yet. So, um, yeah, as you probably you might have seen in the in the blog post in a few months ago, 
uh, we acquired a, a team called uh, Infinite.io. Uh, so yeah, they're helping us with this. Uh, they basically have a solution for uh, shared machine data, data sharing. So yeah, I expect that in the future we will have uh, an Infinite IO volume plugin and uh, volume driver that uh, might even be built in Docker. We, we don't know that yet, but uh, yeah, so far, like no real no real answer for, for this question besides uh yeah trying Rex Ray and, and just waiting for a few plugins to, to come along. Question six, how are the new Docker stack commands implemented? Are the new Docker remote API associated with them? So that's a great question. I, I forgot to mention this. So so far in one thirteen the Docker stack command it's it's uh, only client side. So it's uh, basically when I do a stack list, technically what uh, the client is doing is going to list all the services, going to look at the labels, see all those services are, have the same labels, so therefore they are part of a stack and I'm going to display a stack uh, nicely. It's kind of the same thing that uh, Compose did, the Python tool. So yeah, it works, but uh, we know it's not, it's not the best, so the plan for 114 and it already started uh, the work already started is to bring that to demand side. So in 114, you will have an API to list stack, to remove stack, to do all that stuff. Today, it's client side, but uh, it will be demand side in 114. We will have um, a compatibility code, like a migration code. So if you use stack today that are client side and you upgrade to 114, you will have a, we will have a code pass to basically migrate all your stack demand side. Uh, seamlessly, so nothing will break. You can start using it today, but yeah, there is no new no API yet. Um, question seven about plugins: Is there a way to keep the plugin up to date? Uh, no, currently not. When you do a Docker install, it's like in Swarm; it's it's pinned by digest, and uh, and that's it. Um, so no, today there is no way to to auto update plugins. Um, Unfortunately, the only way today would be to, of course, make sure no containers are using the plugin, and then uh, just uh, Docker plugin uh, remove Docker plugin install again. That's that's the only way today. Question eight: If the Docker stack and compose v3, uh, the DAB mentioned in Docker con last year, it it came for the same idea, of course, uh, but. Uh, it's it's not really the the distributed application bundle. Bundle we are all still working on it. Um, so here we just introduce stacks. You could see a stack, maybe the equivalent of let's say a container for for Docker. So it's a group of um, yeah group of services, group of containers that are running together, and bundles that might come back later might probably be the equivalent of an image. So today we allow to create um, a stack from a compose file. In the future, we might also allow you to create a stack from a bundle, and we might allow you to push and pull bundle, stuff like this, but uh, a stack is not, not a bundle, but uh, the bundle work is still, is still in progress. And the last question, how does image uh, recreamable mean remove an actual unused image? So I believe it's, it's uh, explain you everything when you do the command before removing everything, of course. But uh, I think by default, it's going to remove all untagged images, untagged images, and then you have a dash f command to remove all the images that are unused by container, so even the tagged one. But yeah, by default, it is untagged. Uh, and uh, another question: How many versions back will the CLI backward compat support? I think in the future it's going to, I mean today, it only supports uh, I think 112 and 111, I'm not even sure, 112 for sure, 111, I don't know. And I think going forward we're going to keep this compact, so I, I guess, uh, I don't know, CLI 117 will still support 112. Um, the daemon is compatible with uh, can, can be talked with a very old uh, CLI and still works, so we're probably going to do the same. 
Another question, would an existing compose file work with a Docker stack deploy? So as long as you don't have a build volume from or depend on, I think also, uh, yes, it will. You might have to just change, open the file and put v3 instead of v2, but that's it. Uh, yeah, it will work. It will have, like, use just one instance, one uh, replica per service, and, uh, and the chair, it would work. Are there already plugins in development for alternative storage like S3? So uh, let me check with uh, the Rexway because I know Rexway um, uh, can do EBS volumes, but maybe more. So Rexway, it's it's not by Docker. It's at, uh, it's a vendor agnostic storage tool. So. It supports, on, uh, if you're using EC2, it supports EBS, EFS. Um, yeah, it works on Rackspace. So, I mean, that's the only one I know that is uh, in the works, this one. I know Flocker also, uh, they had a plan to make a plugin, so I think they're working on it right now. Um, that's the only one, uh, the only two I know, Rexway and Flocker. Is the legacy swarm going to be sunset? Um, I mean, there are still no plan to to sunset it. Of course, we there is no really active uh, development on it per se, but it's it's not dead. We did release a, a new a new release uh, recently with uh, like a change log, as you can see on my screen. It, it's not the biggest, but I mean, we still do work on it. It's still here. Um, if you're using uh, our commercial solution, Docker Data Center, Docker Data Center works on both Swarm Legacy and uh, and the new Swarm. So, another question in Docker 113, um, with consuming global mode, will be the same that is in 112. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what the question means. Sorry, I don't get the I don't get the question. Uh, so this one we, we we talked about it already. So yeah, DAPs. Um, I believe the DAP command that was in 112 is still here in 113. Uh, as long as you have experimental, we, it's still here because because uh, we don't want to. I mean, we decided to keep it, even though in 112 it was experimental. So we did say to everybody, it's experimental. It's just a try. We 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 might remove it. But we didn't. But yeah, we are really working on the on the DAB, uh, on the bundle files. But they are. We took the approach of starting by stacks first because using a compose file to start services was a huge demand from everybody. So we took that route, and now that we have stacks, we're going to implement bundles on top. Is there an equivalent for Docker Network Connect for services? Yes, I believe there is. Uh, Um, I think when you do a Docker service update, you can. Um, yeah, I, don't, I definitely know you can uh, add and remove networks to an existing service. I'm sure. I, I just don't know how. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't have it in mind, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's possible. So I, I just can't, fi can't find it. So it looks like we're actually out of time. So I'm going to keep track of the rest of the questions, and then hopefully, um, when Victor has a few moments, he can um, answer them in a doc. So thanks everyone for joining us, and um, we'll be posting the slides and the video recording very soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.